Welcome to Legal and Practical Background Check Considerations. I'm Mike Coffey, President of Imperative Information Group, and this webinar is part of our ongoing series to help employers make well-informed, fair, and uh, legal uh, hiring decisions uh, related to individuals' criminal history and other qualifications. And uh, today we're gonna talk about the background check itself. This webinar is pre-approved for an hour of recertification credit through both HRCI and SHRM. If you're watching this webinar live, then you will receive an email probably tomorrow morning uh, with uh, a link to the recording, but also the HRCI and SHRM research information. If, however, you are uh, watching this uh, webinar as a recording on our website, then at the end of the webinar, there will be a, uh, an image that includes the code you need to enter uh, below this video uh, so you can uh, get research credit. It's uh, important to say right up front that Imperative uh, and I both are, <laughs> since it's my company, are both into uh, making sure candidates have a uh, an opportunity to present their their entire selves, and that we think we feel like giving employers or giving uh, individuals with some sort of criminal history a second chance, or and you know, quite honestly, in many cases, a third chance or a fourth chance um, is important. To, to ensure, first of all, that we don't have a society with a, a giant class of unemployable people, but also just as employers, it's important that we not wipe out a, uh, some percentage of our um, applicant pool without uh, a real strong reason for doing it. And in our, some of our previous webinars in this series, we've talked about how to fairly and legally evaluate candidates, criminal history, uh, ideally before you've ever met the applicant. We wanna talk about that, right? Uh, and, and have an idea for this position, these are the risks and what's connected. We've also had a webinar on how to have that conversation with candidates about their criminal history in a way that's respectful, but very direct and uh, uh, gives you as the employer enough information to decide uh, if, if somebody's history is relevant or not. So when I am consulting with our clients or speaking at conferences or whatever, when I'm talking about your screening process, I'm not talking about just the background check. In fact, I'm a big believer that your screening process starts with the job description. And in that you should, and in the process of defining and, and understanding the role, you should define what the risks are that are associated with that job. They've got access to the elderly, they've got access to the infirm or children or e easily removable assets or money or computer networks or whatever. And, and there's uh, we've got a whole process we've covered in previous webinars about how you go through that information and figure that out. And then you tie those risks that you've identified for this role to specific offenses uh, and based on the age of the offense, you can decide if, if certain kind of behavior is high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And, uh, and certainly that can help you evaluate candidate A versus candidate B versus candidate C, because we, if candidate A is, has this high risk uh, behavior that's fairly recent and candidates B and C have no apparent risk in those areas, and everybody else is, other, and they're all otherwise fully qualified or equally qualified. Then we may look at applicant uh, at the other applicants first before we look at the applicant who we've identified as high risk. And then you're, this is, and this is all before we've ever met the applicant, right? We're just talking about building our policies. And then the applicant uh, applies, and I'm a big believer that your employment application process. 
uh, and how and when you ask the criminal history question of your applicant in the interview process, those are as a big a part of your screening process as anything. And this is the opportunity. If you do that well, and you go through that whole uh, process of gathering the information directly from your candidate, that means when you get to the verification process, the background check, your own calls to previous employers or references or however you're, you're doing that sort of thing, there should be no surprises. You've given the applicant uh, a full opportunity to tell their side of the story and to give you all that information. And so then the background check and the verification process should be pretty straightforward and there shouldn't be any surprises. But as we all know, um, some of your applicants aren't honest with you and I would be out of work and we wouldn't have this company if all your applicants were honest. And so, but that is the screening process that I encourage employers to follow because um, I don't want you to waste your money on a background check that is gonna uh, not produce, you know, eliminate a candidate that far down the process. But because we do know that candidates are not uh, always honest, we do need to verify. Um, but this is a process, if you really follow our process, that will help you be, again, you know, make fair decisions that are also legal, uh, legally defensible, uh, and well-informed. So you've got all the information that's relevant to the job uh, when you're making the decision. So that just kind of fills in where this uh, presentation is. It's really that last, last uh, part of the, the hierarchy there, the verification process is really what we're gonna talk about too, primarily today. Because again, the verification process is just basically a lie detector test. Did this candidate tell me the truth about their criminal history, about their employment history, about what their education, uh, why they left this job or, or what skills they have? All of those things, when you're at the very, you know, at the tail end of that, that recruiting and selection process, hopefully you've asked all those questions and all we're doing is, is verifying what they've told you. So there should be no surprises on the background check. So when you start the background check, the first thing we need to do is verify the identity information provided by the, by the candidate. Um, and you, you may be surprised by how often we encounter candidates who don't give you the right social security number, or even when they have a legitimate one. So I'm not talking about just undocumented workers. I'm talking about also people who know for whatever reason uh, there's stuff out there and they try to uh, hide their identity. So they'll give you the wrong social or they'll change their name, give you different aliases that they, you know, uh, than, than what they're legal name is or what they're they're normally operating under. And so the first thing we need to do is try to uh, corroborate what the applicant or the candidate has said as, as to who they are against records that would suggest that yes, in the public realm, this, this name and date of birth and social security number are consistently used together. Um, I, I, I may have said it earlier, but I don't really call this a verification in most cases, because what we're really doing is we're corroborating the information where we're bouncing it. You know, we take that information, the data bar, social and name that the candidate gives us, and we bounce it against a database of information from a wide variety of sources, credit bureaus and all this other big data that we hear about all the time. And, uh, and we say, OK, so looking at this history, uh, Susan Smith and the state of birth and, and social have been used in all these commercial tra transactions over time. And so we, we can say pretty safely that, yeah, we can uh, corroborate that this is, you know, that these pieces of information uh, are, are really associated with a single person. Now, we still don't know that those pieces of information belong to the individual you're talking to. They could be using somebody else's identity completely. Uh, and that's the, why it's really important in uh, the I-9 process um, that you, um, you really examine those documents, make sure the person really is who they say they are. Because uh, short of biometric information, the next best thing you've got is looking at their government issued IDs and laying your eyes on them and uh, looking at those documents. Now, there are companies that call this identity verification. I just don't like the term verification because it suggests that we are 
from a government source verifying that this name, date of birth, and social really match each other. Now, there are, are times where we can do that. Um, there's a process where called consent-based social security number verification so that we can go to the, the social security administration and say, hey, um, we want to verify this name, date of birth, and social all match your records. And the social security administration will do that. But there's an addition, additional fee associated with it and a, an additional piece of paperwork, yet another piece of paperwork uh, that your uh, candidate has to complete. And so most employers don't do that uh, unless we're unable to strongly corroborate the information that the candidate gave us on the front end through our normal process. The other thing the identity research will tell us, it'll give us a, an address history for the person. Because as we'll talk about in a minute, the court records in, in the US are extremely decentralized. There is no such thing as a national background check. If you ever have somebody tell you they're gonna sell you a national background check, it's snake oil, it doesn't exist, okay? Um, we've got over 3,300 counties in, in the United States, and there's no single source that holds all the criminal records from all those places. Even the FBI stat is not reliable, and we'll talk about that. So we need to know where to go do research. And so like an imperative, our process is to go back and search the records in all jurisdictions where that individual has lived, worked, or attended school in the past 10 years, or where we, during identity research, have just identified them as having been associated. And so that's, uh, we, we, most, uh, most screening companies will do a seven, do a seven year look back. We do 10 just because we deal with really risk averse clients who, uh, you know, want that extra information. We actually have clients who go back 20 years or longer back to age 18 sometimes for certain roles. And so all of that's possible. It's just, do you want to write the check for that? And, uh, and we can certainly uh, help our clients when, when they have those concerns. Uh, so we use identity research to corroborate who the person is and uh, to guide our research, to tell us where to go to do the criminal research. So let's talk about criminal backgrounds. Uh, obviously, that's what most people think about when we say a background check, they think immediately criminal history. And certainly that's important. Uh, and there are, um, there's about roughly 70 to 80 million people in the US with some sort of criminal history. Now, a lot of that, that criminal history is just really minor stuff, you know, a failure to appear for a traffic offense or um, you know, uh, a 20 year old DWI or some, you know, things like that, that, you know, a theft by check, a hot check charge from, you know, 15 years ago. So there's a ton of that out there. And so a lot of that wouldn't be relative, relevant to most of your positions. But then you do find, of course, those, those occasional individuals with some sort of uh, significant and fairly recent criminal history that's directly related to the job. And so as we talk about criminal history, the one thing we have to really remember is while being in, in, in under federal law and in most, most states, being a former criminal offender does not put you in a protected class. However, because individuals of color are arrested, prosecuted, and convicted at a higher rate than the white population, if you're using criminal history uh, and, and especially to eliminate candidates in a way that uh, doesn't have, isn't really tied to a, a legitimate business purpose. If you haven't tied this behavior uh, directly to the job somehow or to the kind of behaviors you need to see in the job, then you may run a, afoul of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And, uh, and if that's the case, and we talked about that, this in one of the other webinars a lot deeper, but if you, if you find yourself in a situation where uh, you're just say, you know, the old line, uh, you know, we want a clean criminal history, clean background check required. In other words, you can't have any criminal history. Um, and I will say, I almost never come across anything other than a tiny, small employer that's not very sophisticated at all that has that kind of policy. Uh, since the uh, Green versus Missouri Pacific case in 1975, most employers have wised up. Plus, you know, we've had a, um, 
a lot more focus as a society on helping former offenders reintegrate into society and giving them a fair chance. So the EEOC back in 2012 did um, produce a, an updated guidance on their use of criminal history. Now it is a guidance only. Uh, and in fact, here where I where you know, I'm in Texas and it's fifth fifth district uh, federal district, uh, the it's not even the EEOC is not even really allowed to apply it to uh, employers, but it's still good guidance. Uh, and there's some stuff in it that's full malarkey, but there's a lot of good guidance in it too. And, and we go into that more in another webinar. But um, if you're a federal contractor, it's probably uh, compliance with this guidance is probably built into your, into your federal contracts. And so if you've got OFCCP uh, contracts, uh, then you probably need to pay more attention to those and go back and look at my my webinar on how to uh, fairly evaluate fairly and legally evaluate candidates criminal history. So I just want to make sure that's out there because uh, from a uh, legal point of view and quite honestly if you're doing it well most of what I recommend employers do is covered in the EEOC guidance they just add some stuff that in my opinion doesn't make a lot of practical business sense. And then, of course, when we're talking about background checks, we're also talking about verifications, verifying the claims the applicants made about their previous employment or their education, things like that. Um, in my, in the, the webinar that kind of kicks off this entire series, Seven Steps to Bulletproof Hiring Decisions, I advocate that, um, that you, you have a more elaborate application when it comes to previous employment than most employers do right now. Uh, ask your candidates legitimate questions about why they left, what were their responsibilities, those kinds of things. I see so many applications um, that are either still paper or electronic where it's, you know, name, rank, and serial number. When, when did you work there? What was your title? And, but they never ask about what were your responsibilities? What skills did you demonstrate there? Um, things like that. And then during the interview, follow up with them and ask, uh, you know, what did they learn during that, that employment? Um, you know, those kind of questions. Get details about why they left employment. That is definitely your business. You're definitely interested in why somebody uh, separated from their previous employer. And if it was, you know, involuntary, that doesn't mean we're going to eliminate them. But what it means is we need to understand why they, they were involuntarily terminated from employment. And so we have those conversations. And those are icky conversations. Employers don't like to have them often. But I think you really need to. But then what you need to do is turn around and ver try to verify whatever they've told you um, during uh, the interview and during the application process so that you've got some confirmation maybe from, a, uh, from someone that what they told you was accurate. Then a lot of employers include driving histories on their background checks, even when driving isn't a part of the job. So let's say they'll never operate a motor vehicle in the course of their work. They're going to sit in our factory all day and operate machinery. Well, first of all, your driving history will give me some idea about how safety aware you are. And so if safety is a big part of a, of a position, if they're operating heavy equipment or anything that's kind of dangerous or driving a forklift, all of that, that gives me some insight into, you know, one ticket is one thing, but if I get a driving history that in the last three years, this, guy, this person's, you know, had, uh, you know, multiple offenses for fair yield right away, speeding, uh, all those kinds of offenses, that tells me this is somebody who's not as safety conscious, safety aware as I might want in this specific role. The other good thing uh, about a driving history is it is a verification that at least the name and address and date of birth that this candidate gave you match the state's records uh, for the, uh, on their driver's license. And so that is a actual verification, at least that the name and date of birth match what the applicants told you. And so that uh, is something that, you know, typically in the background check process is integrated directly with uh, your, whoever your background screening provider system is, and it'll just provide it right away. And so you, you, can, you can quickly verify that before uh, you continue with the rest of the background check. And then there's credit. Now, I quite honestly spend more time talking employers out of running credit on candidates uh, than I do trying to sell them on, to use credit. The thing is, is people want to use credit 
uh, employers often want to use credit. Uh, and they have this idea that, well, if the person manages their personal business uh, well, they'll manage our business. Or they're going to be, you know, somebody with good credit is more responsible, uh, more reliable, or they're going to be getting all these phone calls from debtors, uh, from, from creditors, if they've got a, a, a lot of negative stuff on their credit history. Well, the reality is, that's not so accurate. And uh, the few studies, there are very few studies out there, but the few studies that are out there suggest that candidates with uh, a negative credit history were, were no more likely uh, to be terminated involuntarily or to have performance issues than the rest of the employee population. So what do you use credit for then? Well, there are places where how somebody manages their, their personal business may reflect uh, on how they're going to manage your company business. So certainly if somebody has fiduciary responsibility uh, in the organization, a credit report may be, may be worthwhile. Uh, and I'm not talking about a cashier um, necessarily, uh, as much as I am somebody who's making actual financial decisions on behalf of the company or on behalf of clients, financial advisors, people like that. But there are times, even with a cashier or um, a bank teller or somebody like that, where credit may be relevant, uh, not just because they've got a few negative is issues and slow pays, but if you see someone who's consistently running up a lot of debt, uh, getting, in, you know, getting cards and accounts canceled uh, involuntarily, and then opening new accounts, and they just keep churning and they're not managing, uh, or they're just carrying an extreme load of debt, then maybe in those cases, it makes some sense to say, okay, well, in this environment, uh, we're particularly concerned about theft. We don't have other controls in place to really prevent it very well. And this person's behavior over a longer period of time shown in their credit report, seven years, is consistently somebody who's just not taking care of business very well. And, uh, and we're gonna have other concerns uh, about them, but just a few slow pays, things like that. And the other thing that I need to point out to you about credit is that you don't get a credit score. If, uh, if you're currently ordering credit on your candidates, on your employment candidates, and you see their actual FICA score, then you've got a problem because none of the credit bureaus will sell a credit report with a credit score on it for employment purposes. That's not what FICO was built for. FICO is all about uh, somebody's ability and the expectation that they will uh, repay a debt. And so it's got nothing to do with the employment context. And the credit bureaus sure do not want you as an employer using that, uh, that score for anything like that. So you should be making sure that your credit scores don't get that. What I see a lot are we'll have, uh, we've got credit unions and community banks that are our clients. And, and sometimes what's been happening is somebody in HR just walks over to the finance department or the, the loan department and just has, uh, you know, somebody over there run the candidate's credit. You know, they've got, they're getting the authorization signed off, but the people in the loan department, when they run that credit report, aren't pulling it correctly from the credit uh, bureau and they're getting a score. So just look at that. If, you're, if you see credit scores on... Uh, on your credit reports, and you probably want to re-examine that. So let's get into the, the legal issues on the big scale about the background checks themselves. Now, the, the federal law that governs background checks is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now, ignore the word credit in Fair Credit Reporting Act, because it's not just credit. Uh, this is a law that was uh, passed originally, I think, 1972. and um, it, at that time, background checks were basically credit reports. So that's what people got. And that's what the law was originally really focused on. And at the end of this day, it's still primarily focused on the use of credit in, 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 in many ways. But it really governs a lot more than just credit. And so anytime you're buying information from a third party about a, a candidate or an employee, that is a credit report. So even if you're not using a background screen, screening company like Imperative, but you're going to the National Student Clearinghouse, let's say, to, to verify somebody's degree, because a lot of the uh, colleges and universities will not 
you can't call the registrar up like you used to and uh, to verify their education. So, and they tell you, just call the National Student Clearinghouse. We give them all of our records. And then the National Student Clearinghouse will charge you a fee to access those records. Um, and th that is a consumer report. That's a, and, and so it makes it, uh, it's bound by the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which means you have responsibilities, even though you're not pulling credit. Same goes for the work number. If you're doing your employment verifications in-house and you call an employer and they say, uh, no, well, you have to call the work number uh, or go online and or you know review it on online through the work number and they charge you a fee and it's gotten outrageous. It's a very expensive fee now um, just to look at their employment history, but that's a consumer report. And the laws in the employment context the same laws that apply to that information about space work history that's coming from that third party that you're paying a fee to is the same as a credit report. There's no difference in the employment context. So just so you understand that, and the reason it's, it's important is because people are getting sued about it. Um, the plaintiff's lawyers discovered the Fair Credit Reporting Act about 15 years ago, and they've gone hog wild. And they're suing employers left and right for violations of the FCRA, even where it's just basic uh, basic is issues with just simple compliance stuff or language and the consumer wasn't harmed at all. Um, and, and so, and you don't really wanna defend those lawsuits because as soon as that plaintiff's lawyer is involved and you're pulling files and you're answering subpoenas due to stickums uh, and giving them information, you're, you, they're going to be looking for other things they can sue you for as well and, and other employment practices that, that may be sketchy or just not, you know, maybe all your T's aren't crossed and your I's aren't dotted. Uh, but these things settle. They, they, the, and the plaintiff's lawyers know exactly what they're worth. And uh, the, the cases that I've read about, fortunately, in 23 years, none of our clients have had an FCRA lawsuit. It could happen tomorrow because a lot of these lawsuits are totally bogus and it's just a... a, a either a simple error on the, on the client's part or nothing was wrong. But the plaintiff's lawyers know they can squeeze a company for $25,000 or their insurance company for $25,000 or $50,000 just to make them go away. And they do that a lot. So the FCRA applies whenever it's an employment purpose. And so it's not just pre-employment, not when we're just, just considering a candidate. It's anything related to the employment. So if you're, if you're hiring someone, certainly, but if you're, if you're considering, you're gonna buy information from a third party for an employment purpose would include looking at getting information about this person before you move them into a new role, uh, a promotion or a lateral uh, uh, transfer. But we need, uh, let's say they're gonna be driving now. And we haven't, we don't normally drive, pull driving histories on our, all our employees, but this person's going to be driving. So we're going to, on a, at least an annual basis, pull their driving history. Well, now that's an employment purpose because it's related to their employment. Um, so we need to, it's, it's any, anything related to their perspective or current employment. Basically, if you're buying information about your employee and they're an employee, consider it or a candidate for employment, consider it a consumer report. That's an employment purpose. Now, when you get information directly from the source, if you pick up the phone and just call the candidate, a uh, candidate's former employer, let's say, and you talk to somebody in payroll and they verify the title and the dates of employment and eligibility for rehire, whatever else you ask, that is not a consumer report because you, as the employer, are getting the information directly from the source of the information. And it only becomes a consumer report when it comes through a third party like me, uh, Imperative, or the work number, or your National Student Clearinghouse, or any of those kind of companies. So if you're getting information directly from the source, so like if you physically walk into the courthouse yourself and search the court records, or you go online, if it's, an, if it's a court that, has, that happens to have some of their records online, and you just search those online records, that is not a consumer report. But as soon as you pay somebody other than the record holder for that, that, that information, it's a consumer report. And if you have questions, drop them in the chat box and I'll, I'll, I'm paying attention to that and I'll try to answer those as we go. Oh, I skipped one, there we go. Now there is a carve out 
because there are times where you you need information about your employees while they're employees and you need to conduct an investigation into a violation of company policy or some violation of law uh, and you hire an outside party to come in and do an investigation we do those for our clients and so sometimes you'll need an investigation an actual investigation and sometimes you use your uh, outside counsel to do it. Sometimes you'll use an HR consultant. Sometimes you'll use an investigations company like Imperative. Um, there is a carve out in the FCRA saying that information from a third party about your employee isn't a consumer report, but you still have an obligation under the FCRA to, at the end of the investigation, if based in whole or part on the investigation, you decide to take some adverse action against the employee, suspend them, terminate them, anything like that, um, then you have, the, the FCRA has specific requirements and you have to basically give them a summary of the investigation. There is a special kind of consumer report under the FCRA called an investigative consumer report. And this is in the employment context, what really happens there is I'm picking up the phone and calling a previous employer. Uh, and then I do more than just verify title, dates of employment, eligibility for rehire. I get into more subjective information. I'm actually conducting an interview with uh, this previous employer, um, you know, asking questions. We've got a list of standard questions we always ask. Uh, and, and, you know, things like, did they ever act in a threatening or coercive manner? Um, was there ever any reason to question their in honesty or integrity? Things like that. You go through those kind of questions. That makes it an interview, right? Or would you recommend this person for employment? That makes it an interview. It's not just a, a simple verification of black and white facts. And as soon as that happens, it's an interview. And the investigative consumer report portion of the Fair Credit Reporting Act applies. Now, the good thing is, most background screening companies, including Imperative, we just assume that at some point there's a good chance that even just your straight criminal history background check is could turn into an investigative consumer report. So we just include that investigative consumer report language in our sample documents that our clients use all the time. And so it's not a giant issue for you. It's more an issue for us uh, in, in, in making sure that, that we're using information from reliable sources. So, um, but you need to know it's out there because um, there have been some employers who've gotten in trouble because they didn't have the investigative consumer report language in their disclosures and authorization documents. And down the road, uh, they ended up purchasing something that, that uh, was an investigative consumer report. So what can we include in the background check? That's, you know, you hear all of the stuff, um, you can't report this, you can report this, or this isn't, you know, employer can't do this, uh, or the background check can include this, whatever the information is. So under the federal law, and this is primarily the law in most states too, uh, criminal convictions, a a, a, you know, if somebody is found actually guilty for a criminal offense, it's reportable forever. So uh, an employer can be told include, can be told in a consumer report about a conviction for jaywalking in 1972, and that's imperative policy. If the employer can legally use it and we can legally report it, and we see that information, we report everything to our clients. Now, other background screening companies uh, will limit their reporting of criminal convictions to only seven years. And so you'll only get convictions in, in, that happened in the last seven years. And what that means is if it's seven years and six months ago, this person, this case was filed against this person, um, many of the background screening companies won't report that to you. But legally in most states and under federal law, it is reportable. Now, non-conviction criminal information, deferred adjudication or straight dismissals, those are only reportable for up to seven years. Except if the individual is going to make more than $75,000 a year, everything's fair game. So if, and that $75,000 seems like kind of a low number, 
um, because this law has been around for a long time and they've just not ever really changed it to keep upping it up because the idea was that these senior executives or highly compensated individuals, uh, employers should probably be able to get deeper into their history. Uh, so that $75,000 number is, uh, is out there. And so that applies to uh, non-convictions. So if they weren't found guilty, but they got for adjudication or dismissed, but also civil cases, liens and judgments, uh, negative employment information. Somebody was terminated uh, involuntarily eight years ago, and they're only going to make $50,000 a year. And even if that employer says, hey, that guy's a dirty bum, I can't tell you as an employer if they're going to be making less than, than $75,000 a year. And so, uh, but I can tell you for seven years, I can't tell you after seven years. And then there are state laws and some states, California being a great example, limit the information that either the background check company can tell the employer, uh, but more often what it is, is they limit the information an employer can consider. And so that kind of leaves uh, the background check company in a weird place. Do we tell every, uh, uh, an employer everything we can tell them, you know, legally that, that, you know, that we can legally report to them? Well, if we do that, we're giving them the rope to hang themselves with, right? Or, uh, or do we do what, what imperative does is we tell you everything that we can legally report to you and that to the best of our knowledge, it even gets down to the city level in some places with their own restrictions but to the best of our knowledge that an employer can use so we try to give you everything we can legally give you and everything an employer can legally use now they're talk to your own background screening company about what they're doing because some some background screening companies limit everything as i said earlier they will only report convictions in the last seven years period they won't tell you about anything uh, that wasn't a conviction. Even some of the background screening companies uh, out there won't even tell you about deferred adjudication. And we talk about this in another webinar, but a deferred adjudication means you play guilty or no uh, contest to an offense. You've taken responsibility for it. And certainly it's reasonable for an employer to believe you engaged in that conduct. And the whole point of criminal history is not to repunish somebody or to be punitive to them because of what they've done in the past. The whole point of the, of the criminal history search and inquiry into the criminal history is to understand what their past behavior is and how it may project into the future uh, in, in the role that you're in, how it may affect their suitability for the role that you're considering them in. But in some places, there are things uh, you know I can legally report to the employer, but they can't legally use. And so we won't give that to them because I'm not going to give you the rope to hang your stuff with. Now, that's a real pain in the neck for our team. Uh, and we, we are constantly updating our list of now San Francisco's got this rule or New York City just changed this rule. And we're constantly uh, modulating our internal practices so that we can give, you know, we can look and say, OK, this employer is located here in Texas, which pew, pew, Texas, we can do report everything that the federal law lets us report. But the candidate lives in New York City. And so our policy, and it's probably the wisest policy out there for somebody who's like imperative and really wants to give as much information as we can to our clients, uh, the best policy is to figure out where the candidate lives, because these are consumer protection laws, so where the candidate lives matters, and where the job is. And whatever the most restrictive of those restrictions are between those two locations, if, they're, if it's multi-state, uh, is what we follow, whatever the most restrictive is. And so a candidate in New York City who um, is applying for a job with an employer based in Texas, we're still gonna follow those restrictive New York City rules, which are nuts, um, rather than uh, Texas where we can pretty much tell you just about everything that the federal law will, will allow. Another thing that we just need to cover real quick is that the FCRA does require that you make certifications to the uh, consumer reporting agency, the background check company, but you're gonna follow the law. So that's typically uh, included in your, um, in your service agreements and places like that, um, that you'll follow the law and uh, that you've got a valid purpose uh, for uh, requesting the, the background check. Now, you're gonna have to make another certification at the time of order as well. We'll get into that in a minute. So the first thing you 
it, when it comes down, the rubber meets the road as far as the FCRA goes for employers when you get to the point where you're about to order the background check on the individual. And the first thing you have to do is make a valid, under the FCRA, a valid disclosure to the individual that you're going to order a consumer report for employment purposes about them. That disclosure uh, is, is really specific and we'll talk about what you can't have in that disclosure. But basically that's it. It's a disclosure that, hey, we as the employer are going to uh, order a, a consumer report in connection with your prospective or current or continued employment. That's pretty much it. And then you also have to get their written authorization to do so. And it can also be an electronic signature under the eSign Act, the Federal eSign Act. But as I said, you can't have a bunch of extraneous information in that document. And that's where I see a lot of employers, even employment law attorneys give employers bad documents uh, that, that have the disclosure language, but then it has a release of liability or, or an at will statement. That stuff's great at the end of the employment application. It's great on the authorization document even for the background check, but the disclosure itself needs to have only the information that, hey, we're gonna order a background check for employment purposes, maybe you know, list the, the screening company, uh, and that's it. And so when you see these other, I see a lot of these disclosure documents still after you know, dealing with this, uh, this issue since the, this law changed last in 97 relevant to this information, uh, I still see employers who have the wrong information uh, and, and, uh, and they're getting sued. And this is something a plaintiff lawyer loves. The plaintiff lawyers love to see these disclosure documents with extraneous information in them because the, they just want. That's basically it. They just want. And they know you're, you're going to settle or your insurance company is going to settle. And then at the time of order, and this is kind of a, th a thing you should, that'll help you decide if you're using a legitimate background check company or not. At the time of order, you should be required by your screening company to certify that you're not gonna use the information for any purpose other than information that you're requesting it for, and that you're not gonna use it to violate any um, uh, civil rights laws, like you know, Title VII or any state or local ordinances. You're not gonna use this in a way that violates any other, uh, any other laws. And you should have to certify, you should, should be certifying that every time you order a background check. If you're not, you should talk to your screening company to find out why. So let's say you order the report, then the, the background check comes back. And let's say there's something you weren't expecting on the background check. Uh, let's, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's a criminal history piece or, uh, the employment dates were different. Somebody, you know, we see that a lot. Applicants who have a year or 18 months of unemployment uh, between jobs will just kind of mush together the, the, the previous and, and subsequent employers' dates so it doesn't look like they were unemployed very long or at all. And that's something that a lot of employers consider fraud. You lie on the application, and I'm always telling employers, if, you, if, if, you, if they lie to you coming in the door, it's not reasonable to expect their behavior to change after you hire them. So let's say it's just you know, something as simple as employment dates were significantly off. Um, and you don't know that maybe I'm going to hire them anyway, maybe I'm not. Let's say you know, that decision is not even made yet. But we see something on the report that may lead us to take adverse action, you know, not hire them or offer them a different role or whatever. Then we think you should, then the, the law requires that you give them a copy of their report and a copy of their rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And that's a document that's outlined that was created by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Federal Trade Commission. And it's multi, multiple pages. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, you have to give them that copy of the report and the copy of their rights before you take any adverse action. And so some clients and some employers will have us just automatically send it to the applicant every time. So it's already done. So even if the background check is completely clear, the candidate gets a copy electronically 
uh, via email securely and all that. But um, that will take care of it. That, that covers this. But if you haven't done that, and you say, oh, well, look at this. This guy's got a conviction for murder. I'm not going to hire him for this role. Before you post that job out there again or go start talking to your next candidate, you've got to give them a copy of their report and a copy of their rights under the law. And then take a breath. Okay, just breathe deep and let give the candidate an opportunity to look at the information. Um, and there, there are rules of thumb out there. Back in the old days, before everything was elect electronic in our industry, employers were actually physically mailing the, the copy of their report and the summary of, of rights to candidates. And so you would put it in envelopes, stick a stamp on it, and mail it off. And so the rule of thumb became, well, you should wait at least seven days before taking that adverse action. Uh, before actually saying, okay, we're not going to hire you. You keep it, keep the position open and, and, and all of that for at least seven days. That was a rule of thumb. Now, except with the exception of a, a few uh, of a, you know, a couple states and municipalities that may have restrictions on, on how long you have to hold the position open, that's not in the law or any court decision. It's still not horrible advice, but because what you really want to do is just make sure the candidates receive that. So we rarely mail those documents and employers may rarely mail those documents because our system and a lot of other screening company systems let you just push a button and it emails directly to the candidate uh, a link where they can securely review their report and get a copy of their rights. And so, and, and then every time they do it, it, it enters uh, their IP address and records the time and all of that. And usually they have to put in the last four digits of their social and their date of birth, things like that to verify it's really them. And so they've received that information sometimes within an hour of the time you receive the report, right? Because you see the report, this person's an ax murderer, I'm gonna send this report to them and, and it shoots it off. And, and I advise clients, if there's something that's a red flag and you need to keep moving forward with the recruiting process and you don't wanna lose your next candidate, send that off, pick up the phone and call the candidate and say, hey, uh, are you near your computer? We just got your background check back and I want to talk to you about something. And have them jump on their computer, pull their email up, click on that link, log in and look at their report and go through the report with them and say, okay, you know, you've got this, uh, uh, this, you know, this series of DWIs you had and you had your third DWI six months ago. Uh, talk to me about that. And really, if they've confirmed that it's really true, that's really them, then They've had a fair chance to review the information. They've confirmed to you that it's accurate. So you can make the hiring decision. You can just move forward. Now, the EEOC still wants you to evaluate, um, you know, the relevance to the job and, and a whole list of things that they call individualized assessment. And we talk about that in another webinar. But, um, but under the FCRA, there's nothing in the law that says you have to wait seven days or even hold it for 48 hours or 24 hours. The important thing is that you that they've looked that they, they're aware uh, of of the information and they're not disputing the accuracy of it. And they've told, especially if they, you can get them to tell you that it's accurate. But take a breath. Some you know a lot of employers don't pick up that phone and call every time, and so they'll send that uh, that document electronically, and then they'll two or three days later even look in the, in, in our report system and say, okay, yeah, look. The applicant, and it's funny because they always look at it two or three times. The applicant looked at it on at two o'clock yesterday afternoon, again at six o'clock yesterday, and again this morning at nine o'clock. And so you say, okay, they've had you know 24, 48 hours since they've looked at it, and we don't have any issue. You know, they're not they're not disputing it. So you know they've received it, that they've reviewed it, then you can go ahead and make the decision. But if the candidate reaches out to you and says, Hey, that's not right, that's not me. Um, sometimes they're right. And so um, it's very rare. If you're working with a really good background screening company, it should, it'll almost never happen that there's an error in the report that you have to reach back out to the uh, uh, screening company and say, hey, this wasn't right. That's, I mean, it should be the ex a great exception of the rule. But actual identity theft and criminal records does happen. So I hear a lot. I talk from applicants all the time. Oh, that's not me. That was my cousin and they used my identity and blah, blah, blah. And that 
every time we've ever had that allegation and we've looked into it, we've never been able to, to, to verify it. Uh, but this is a case straight from our files from years ago where we had a candidate who was uh, or a client with a large social services organization here in, in Texas, and they were hiring someone as a program manager and we're running the background check. This person had been consistently employed here in, here in Texas uh, for multiple years, and we're going along doing the background check. And boom, a couple of criminal records show up for, for the person, one out of South Carolina and one out of Navarro County, Texas. Okay, the problems were that they served jail time on some of these things. And at the same time, we had verified their employment uh, and they've been consistently employed in places other than Navarro County, Texas and, and South Carolina. So the question was, how is that possible? So I pick up the phone and I called the employer and said, hey, so tell me about uh, this person. And, and I should mention, uh, there are a lot of people with the same name and date of birth out there. There's there, there could, you know, if your name's John Smith, Jose Gonzalez, there's going to, you know, common names, there's going to be other people with that same date of birth. Uh, you know, there's a decent probability. So it's possible that things get mixed up. But this guy's name was like the most unique name. Think, you know, you know, Hezekiah Isaiah Roddenbaum. I mean, just, just think the most unique name that you can consider. It was a really unique name. And, the, and, and you know, but the criminal records match the name and date of birth. So, um, so I call the client up and say, hey, so tell me about, uh, you know, you know, Mr. Roddenbog or whatever it was. And uh, they and they said, well, he's uh, he's, you know, he's, he's got an amazing reputation. He's well known in the community and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, we had already because of this, this uh, challenge between his employment was consistent, but he also had been in jail. In other places, we had gone ahead and ordered the court cop copies of the court files and copies of these mug shots that you see right here. And it's hard to believe it, but this is the same guy, six years apart. So he had a rough six years, clearly. But, um, and I said, well, no, no, describe to me, you know, he's, he's a great social worker, blah, blah, blah. That's great. But describe to me what he looks like. And he said, well, he's a, about a six foot two black guy. This is not the guy, right? And so, but the criminal history, I mean, it's got there, it, it, you know, the name and date of birth, and it's really unique, and it really looks like it's the same person. So now we know we're not dealing with the right person, because this guy is not a six foot something black guy. So um, I pick up the phone and call the applicant. And I'm talking to him. And I, I said, hey, uh, we're doing your background check. And, and have you, are you aware that there's somebody basically using your name and date of birth out there? Um, and they've got a criminal history. And he was completely unaware of it. And this was, this is probably 10 years ago or more. So this criminal history had been floating around for 10 or 12 years by that time. And he, uh, he but he said, you know, explain so much because every time I get pulled over uh, for a traffic ticket or anything like that, it take, they sit in a squad car, they sit in a police car for a long time uh, running my data before, um, before the, you know, you know, they write the ticket or, or give me a warning and, and let me go. And he just had little weird things happen over the years uh, and including employment opportunities that just disappeared. Uh, and he didn't know why. Well, this is why. And, uh, you know, and, and I said, well, did you have you ever experienced any identity theft or anything like that? And he said, well, back in the mid 90s, when I was in the military, I was stationed in South Carolina then for a period of time. And my identity was stolen. Somebody opened a check book, checking account under my name and did several things and a bunch of hot checks and stuff. Um, and well, this is who did it, right? Okay, so, and the guy didn't even know this guy was out there using his information. And so we helped him connect with uh, the appropriate authority at the local sheriff's department who could help him get a statement that he is not this person. Because what's happened is the first time this guy got arrested, he used our candidate's information. And now this guy's fingerprints are, are associated uh, with the other guy's identity information. So every time he gets arrested, he's, uh, he just gives them the other guy's name. And he, he served jail time under it. And there were uh, in the court file, there were two different social security numbers in each of these cases uh, for, for this. 
and neither one one belonged to a woman and one was not a valid social security number at all. So all of that story to say, if your applicant says, hey, that's not me, it probably is, but give them the benefit of the doubt. Let your background screening company go do the additional research and go try to figure that out because sometimes it's not. But ultimately, uh, if the candidate disputes it and the background screening company comes back and says, no, this is really them, or if, or this is really accurate, whether if it's an employment reason, we see that a lot, uh, that the candidate will call and say, uh, they said I wasn't eligible for rehire. Well, yes, I am. Or, um, or that they're, you know, uh, this is not my termination date or whatever. Well, often, it, you know, most of the time it, we, we verify it's accurate, but um, if ultimately based in whole or part on the background check, uh, after the applicants receive their copy of their summary of rights and their report, you have to give them another notice that you're taking the adverse action based in whole or part on the report. It also has to have uh, how to contact a background screening company uh, and a notice that the background screening company didn't make the hiring decision, that this is the employer's hiring decision, but uh, this is, if you want to punch somebody in the nose, here's how you reach Mike Coffee. Uh, those kind of things. And, and, and your, your screening company will give you a, a sample adverse action letter. It's pretty straightforward stuff, but you need to make sure you do it because that's, again, it's part of the F Fair Credit Reporting Act. And that is all the time we've got. Um, I, I want to encourage you to listen to Good Morning HR. It's my, my webinar or my webinar, my podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value. Uh, we drop a new episode every Thursday morning, and you can get it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, it's on YouTube, uh, or at goodmorninghr.com. And uh, you can, my book, uh, which covers the seven steps to pull up proof hiring decision is available on our website at imperativeinfo.com slash seven, or you can just text seven to three, eight, four, seven, zero. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Uh, but short of that, right about now is where the card will show up for people who are watching the recorded webinar. And uh, that co the code on that card uh, is what you'll use to fill out the form below in order to get uh, the, the HRCI and SHRM recertification information. And if you're watching this just straight on YouTube, you do need to go to imperativeinfo.com slash webinars to actually uh, to fill out the uh, recertification request. So I don't see any questions. So I do appreciate everyone taking uh, the time to join me today. If there's anything I can do to be of service to you professionally or personally, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm Mike Coffey. I wish you all the very best. Be safe, be well, talk to you soon.